This week, we're joined by esteemed author Jay Galantine to talk all about his new book, Born to Explore at the Solar System's Distant Horizons, and he has promised us dramatic stories. Yep, Jay has previously released two of our favorite space books, Ambassadors from Earth, pioneering explorations for, with unmanned spacecraft, and Infinity Beckoned, adventuring through the inner solar system, 1969 to 1989. Don't forget to continue to get in touch with your thoughts and comments. You can find us on our social media pages at Space and Things One on Twitter and at Space and Things Podcast on Instagram and Facebook or via the contact form on our website. And please hit the share button and let your space flight loving friends know all about our show. But right now, enjoy episode 97 of the Space and Things Podcast. Things with Dave Giles and Emily Carney. I'm Emily Carney. And I'm Dave Giles, and welcome to episode 97 of our podcast. So, with loads of feedback on last week's episode, it was really great. Thank you so much to everyone who got in contact. I'm gonna, we'll talk about this a little bit at the end of the, of the podcast, but I just wanted to say from the very top, we love hearing from you. One Interesting thing to note was that George Leopold, one of our guests we had earlier on when we talked about the Apollo 1 fire, he said researcher Danny Parker is currently doing a deep dive into the life of Scott Carpenter for a new biography. So that is exciting to know, and we have found that out as a result of doing our podcast last week. So please do get in contact if you've got any information about any of the topics we talk about. It's always great for us to keep learning and knowing about what's going on. Thank you very much. Anyway, on to this week's main event. Let's get ready to roll. No, 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 Dave. You're not allowed to do that. We're going to get sued. Oh, yeah, of course. Yes, yeah, copyright. Anyway, I'm sorry. Uh, but talking about getting <laughs> sued, today's guest has been through all of that. But I'm sure we'll find out more about that in a little bit. Yes, today we're talking to author Jake Allentine. <laughs> that is the most bizarre intro to an author I've ever had. This is an author who knows about lawsuits. Um, yes, today we're talking to author Jay Galantine, whose research is focused on uncrewed lunar and planetary exploration. He has written and released two excellent books, which are both part of the Outward Odyssey series from the University of Nebraska Press. His first book was called Ambassadors from Earth, Pioneering Explorations with Unmanned Spacecraft. And this one won the 2009 Eugene M. M. A. Award for Astronautical Literature. Very well deserved. He followed it in 2016 with Infinity Beckoned, Adventuring Through the Inner Solar System, 1969 through 1989. These are both really excellent and take a deep dive into space vehicles that have gone to deep space and how, how they really came to be. Yeah, so we were excited to find out that Jay is working on a new book with a working title of Born to Explore. So we thought we'd ask him to come on to talk about what he's been up to and to find out a little bit about some of those past experiences of writing those first two books. Okay, we're off to a good start. Play it cool. We nearly always begin our interviews with a scene-setting question. So what led you to starting your first book, Ambassadors from Earth, which uh, actually won an award. It won a uh, Eugene uh, M.A. Award. It did. It also got me sued. Uh, so there were definitely <laughs> some emotional highs and lows on that project. Well, I'd always been a closet space geek, which I successfully concealed from all of my high school girlfriends. And I'd always been a closet writer. And the two never really came together until I saw a post on Robert Perlman's awesome Collect Space website back in 2004. It really piqued my curiosity because it said that this uh, publishing company, the University of Nebraska Press, which apparently is quite a large academic publisher, they were going to be assembling a brand new eight book series on the history of space exploration. And they had all eight titles sort of roughed out uh, with a basic outline and whatnot. And they had found writers for four of them, but they needed writers for the other four. And they were open to first-time authors. And if you were interested to email this guy in Australia named Colin Burgess, and Colin would fill you in on the details. And I said, well, well, what are the options? Looking back on it now, what 
2004 me said at the time was shoot all the good ones were taken Mm -hmm. because I had really wanted to do the one about the Apollo moon landings and somebody had snatched that up and somebody had snatched up the one about uh, Mercury and Gemini as well. And I think the Skylab one was taken also. And I'm like, well, shoot, what do you got left? He said, well, we got a couple on the shuttle program and I was kind of a shuttle fanboy in my early teens, but just had really had it bad for those those Apollo flyboys in their white suits. And it's like, ah, the shuttle wasn't as exciting as, as Apollo was. So, yeah, what else you got? And he's like, well, the last one we have is on space probes. And I'm like, what do you mean? <laughs> and Colin said, well, you know, weather satellites and orbiting the moon and and I'm like, okay, it, you're really going to have to sell it better than that because that just <laughs> does not sound exciting at all. And even after I got the project and I had a, a, a terrible time coming up to speed trying to sort of garner interest in what I was doing when people would say, oh, I heard, Jay, I heard you're writing a book. You know, what is it about? I'm like, it's about space probes. Oh, <laughs> well, uh. Hey, that's so cool, man. Are you going to watch the Knicks game tonight? And the conversation would kind of end right there. I mean, keep in mind, me, lifelong space buff, space buff since I was 10 years old or whatever, and he's telling me about this as I would find out the significant aspect of space history. I just really wasn't interested in it. You say that, you know, the Apollo command module, and it's like, squirrel? (laughs) <laughs> you want to know what's going on there. But but when it would come to like Voyager or going to Jupiter, it's like, God, who cares about Jupiter? <laughs> so I went to the library and got like nine books on exploring the planets or something like that. And I'm leafing through them and they weren't selling it really well either. And one of the books had a picture taken from the surface of Venus. And you could see part of the spacecraft. You could see this like little landing ring and there was this arm sticking out to one side this book was telling me all about the chemical composition of the atmosphere of venus and the pressures on venus and the volcanoes on venus and i'm like no 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 no. how 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 did you get the picture i want to know how they got the picture so then I start looking online, I start looking at other books, and nothing is is really telling me to my satisfaction how they took the picture. And part of my disease, frankly, you two, is that I, when there's a story that I want to know, I want to know the whole story. I want to know down to, as I say it, how the electrons are moving. And so I'm like, it really seems like something's missing here. Not only are they not telling me how they got the picture, they're not telling me who got the picture. And whenever you would read about the Russian space program or even American planetary exploration, it would be this nebulous, the Russians launched the spacecraft to Venus. And I'm like, well, why and <laughs> how? And more so in the American space program, it's like, why did they go to Jupiter then? Like, why was it so important then? And so I kind of wrote this uh, proposal based on all that. And I sent it off to Colin and I was like, well, this is awful. I just wasted most of the summer here. It's like my kids are playing quietly on the floor while I'm like typing away (laughs) at at something that's not going to happen. And I was feeling really down, I have to tell you. And so to help myself feel better, I bought a sports car. (laughs) <laughs> I drove that for like two or three weeks and just like had a a really nice time feeling sorry for myself and doing something else with my life. And then I got this letter in the mail that was like, congratulations, we've hired you to write this book. I didn't think they were going to choose me because I deviated from the recommendations. I said, let's skip all this weather satellite stuff. Let's let's skip like the desalination of Sri Lanka. It's like it's going to be a hard enough sell as it is. Let's focus in on the moon and the planets and the really the human stories of trying to do this. So the car went in the garage and I <laughs> sat down for five years <laughs> and cranked out that first book. We will get onto your, your current research shortly, but for that book that you just spoke about, You interviewed the legendary James Van Allen of the Van Allen Belt fame. So tell us a bit about that experience. What was it like to work with him? 
you just had this feeling that you were sitting in a room with someone who is just on a different level from you, that there was no question that you could ask, that there was nothing you could say that would have been new to him. And had I looked at the floor, I, I would have imagined that he would have been levitating slightly several <laughs> inches above the floor. What was interesting about Van Allen was, you know, at 90, he was still going into work every day. He wow. was still packing up his own lunch and getting into his battered, rusty Jeep Cherokee and driving a few miles in from northern Iowa City uh, into the building with his name on the outside. And he was still working on issues. So somebody like me, you know, this guy coming along who's like, right, Dr. Van Allen, I'm writing my first book and I'd really like to talk to you about it. <laughs> yeah. Would that be okay? And he said no a couple of times. At one point, he's like, well, let me see what questions you would ask me. And so I just buckled down and like locked myself in a dark room. And I spent like two weeks trying to come up with all these questions. And in Van Allen's polite Midwestern style, which continually opened doors through him, for him throughout his, his life and work. He didn't say your questions aren't good enough. What he said was, I expected a more mature line of questioning, Mr. Gallantine, <laughs> which you had to think about that for a little bit, but then you could slowly translate that, you know, inside my little reptilian brain to, oh, you know, that means that the questions aren't good enough. And so finally, I made this emotional appeal. Uh, you could just call him. And if he was in his office and he wasn't on the phone, he would answer. Just, hello. <laughs> Not James Van Allen or anything. It was just, hello. Like, did I get the right guy? You know, I didn't have caller ID. He didn't have caller ID. Who knew? And I finally said, Dr. Van Allen, you have done such important, critical work in understanding the solar system. But it's so locked up in all of these technical papers and reports. Let me tell your story in a way that people can understand. Let me try and strip out the big words and some of the techno babble and really make an appeal to the common reader. And I think I can get you like an extension of your support base based on that. I will drive down there and interview you in person. We don't have to do this over the phone. And that's kind of what, what really tipped that needle over. And I got in to see him. Uh, I was nervous as all get out. And I just walked away from there, really with no appreciation at the time for just, just what a significant figure he was. Um, and on this third book, actually, there has been so much of his influence that permeated into uh, these missions that ended up going to Jupiter and Saturn. Then I went back to my Van Allen interviews and just found whole sections where he and I had talked for these huge periods uh, that, and I hadn't used any of that in information, uh, any of his comments. And I'm like, I got to put some of this stuff in. I mean, this guy was a prime mover mm -hmm. in this effort to get to Jupiter. And I really need to work in more of these discussions. So your first book, focused on outer uh, solar system interplanetary exploration, which, unbeknownst to me when I read it, it was not uh, without some controversy, uh, particularly the, the story of the Grand Tour and who came up with the Grand Tour. Would you like to discuss that? <laughs> I am very happy to discuss it because I, I continue to be frustrated with all of the misinformation one of the, the key missions, people call it the greatest planetary exploration mission that could ever be, is Voyager. So there were these two nearly identical Voyager spacecraft that launched in 1977 and went to the outer planets. They're still out there. They are still functioning, although they're, they're getting kind of low on power, but they're mm -hmm. still working. I found multiple different credible sources that were each giving me a different answer for how the mission got started. And I'm, I'm trying to get to the bottom of this and I'm like, what is going on? And so I finally got this guy on the phone named Gary Flandro. And Flandro was in my proposal because he had shown up in a book called The Planets. It explained in very straightforward fashion that he was a summer intern at JPL in 1965, 
And quite by accident, he discovered this alignment of the planets and he turned it into a proposal, which became a study, which became a technology development effort. And that became the Grand Tour, which was Voyager. And he was like, so have you had a chance to talk to Mike Minovich yet? And I'm like, you know, I've, I've heard about that guy. I've seen him in some of these other articles and stuff. And, and he's like, well, you know, he's, he's going to tell you something different if you manage to get him on the phone. And Flandreau kind of left it at that. Um, I did finally get through to Minovich, who is, is still around, by the way, as is Flandreau. And Minovich had a completely different story, kind of an ugly story about how he was this hardworking, hard charging, focused, devoted, a part time employee at JPL. He was there while he was working on his mathematics PhD at UCLA. Uh, not only did he discover the alignment of the planets that became the Grand Tour, he also discovered this fundamental principle of using gravity to get from one planet to the next. And Minovich promised to send me um, all of this documentation and evidence that would prove his side of the story. He encouraged me to do my own research and let that research take me to whatever conclusion that I did. Um, along the way, I discovered a lot of like disgruntled co-workers of theirs who would roll their eyes at this idea that there was this conspiracy on the part of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory to steal Minovich's work and discredit him. Um, you didn't hear any of that about Flandro. And I spent so much time researching that, that the whole end of the book, Ambassadors, it, it wasn't going to get done on time. It was a pretty deep rabbit hole. And I think I got to the bottom of it. And at the end of the day, Minovich's story just does not hold up to scrutiny. So unfortunately, he's got his fans, he's got his believers, and he's managed to convince enough people of his story that it gets out there into the world. At the start of the pandemic, I was on some panel discussion and, and we were all going around and we were all asked for our advice if we wanted to get into any kind of history writing, really. And I said, you know what? You've really got to know the sources of your sources. And I still preach that today if I go speak to a middle school or something like that. And I'll give you just a, a wonderful example of how the misinformation has really become a problem. And it's in this document called the Voyager Neptune Travel Guide. So in August of 89, Voyager 2 was getting ready for its final planetary encounter. It was going to happen in late August. It was going to be Neptune. And JPL was having this celebration like no other. I mean, the campus was just filled with reporters and uh, members of the general public. And there were tours and there were viewing parties and all this stuff. As part of the celebrations, JPL put together this, this document with a wonderfully cute name called the Voyager Neptune Travel Guide. And it was edited by Charlie Colhase, who is no slouch. He was Voyager's mission design manager, really a, a key person. And one of the introductory chapters starts out by saying that Michael Minovich, as a part-time JPL employee, he came up with this concept of gravity assist and he identified the grand tour opportunity. Well, this is an official NASA publication and mm. it gets cited all the time. So I went looking for the sources of the Voyager Neptune travel guide. You get Charlie on the phone and he tells you all about how that travel guide came to be. He says, oh my gosh, I was so busy getting ready for the Neptune encounter and I got this task laid on me. Charlie, we're going to need to have this guide for Neptune and you seem like the person to be in charge of it. And so Charlie like basically parceled out the different chapters. Hey, you know, could you do this? Could you do this? Could you do this? And unbeknownst to him, uh, a couple of JPL people, Rex Ridenauer and William Cosman, were huge fans of Minovich's story. They had bought into it and they wrote up that section. Charlie didn't even look at it. <laughs> you know, by his own admission, he he did not review the Voyager Neptune travel guide before it went to print. 
and he said that this was one of those things that he just has kicked himself about ever since then. And so what happens is people want to do everything online. And so they find that document online and they write a blog post online saying, oh, yeah, it was Minovich. And then people start citing blog posts. Sometimes they're citing blog posts in printed, published books. I've been having this back and forth with this guy who I I, I, I don't want to name right now because it, he's being really civil about it, but he's sticking to his guns that he's he's got this blog out there and he's had it for years and years. And he's like, well, one of my sources is the Voyager Neptune Travel Guide. And I'm like, did you talk to Charlie about it? And he's like, the, the travel guide's good enough for me. And I'm like, well, no. So Minovich swore up and down that he was first with Gravity Assist, that he was first with Voyager. He had encouraged me to go looking for the answers on my own. So I did that. And I started talking with his coworkers other people who would have an understanding of a gravity assist and its place in history, including Van Allen. And Van Allen was like, no, the principle of the gravity assist has been understood for a very long time. And you, you go and research the literature and this stuff goes back literally hundreds of years to a time, obviously long before spacecraft, when astronomers would see how the motion of a comet would change when it passed by a huge planet like Jupiter. They didn't have the math worked out for how to get a spacecraft from Earth to Jupiter, but this is how ideas evolve. And by the time we got into the 1920s, the idea had really grown legs. And by the time of the 1950s, you know, as the literature shows, People like MIT physicist Richard Batten, who I contacted, were actively working out the math for these. Minovich's story just doesn't hold up. What's weird is, uh, you know, at the end of the day, I have found myself as unintentionally like the world's authority on the history of gravity assist and the origins of Voyager. And it's not what I intended to do um, <laughs> when I went into writing about space. Uh, but the truth is, if if I had to pick one thing that was like my finest hour, if there's one thing that people ask me, Jay, what is your contribution to space history? It would be getting to the bottom of this controversy over the origins of the gravity assist maneuver and the origins of Voyager. What happened after the book or, or what happened? I think it may have happened before the book was published. I, I'm not sure. Can yeah. you tell us about it? Absolutely. So one thing that I've tried to be very open about is sending chapter drafts. I don't want to have something come out that I got wrong, you know, some some little or big detail or whatever it is. So first they go to Colin and if they kind of like pass the sniff test and everything seems reasonable and rational with Colin, <laughs> then stuff starts going out to the interview subjects. You know, I start with them and and then they get to review it. And then after they've they've kind of had their say with it, then it goes on to colleagues or just general interest readers or or whomever, you know, and, and by the time you get out to them with the colleagues, it's like, eh, you know, you miss some facts on the space shuttle solid rocket booster. And with the general interest readers, it's like, you know, you lost me in this section here, whatever. So there's definitely different reasons that you're sending that stuff out. The first time I sent drafts to Minovich, they came back in a box and the box was like nine inches tall. It was my letter to Minovich with the drafts and they had now become a source. And then he had rewritten the chapters I, almost completely. They were three times as long as they had been before. In his cover letter, which ran to something like 30 pages, he had all of this additional detail that he wanted to work in. And at one point he said something like, you know, this math is really what the young kids want to hear about. And I'm like, oh, okay, Mike, gotcha. So this continued with, with Mike uh, in, in an iterative process for about another year. And the tone of his responses 
as he slowly realized that I wasn't going to, to write what he wanted me to, it changed from, no, 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 you've got it wrong, to why are you doing this to me? I'm sending you all of this information in 2013. So this was two, three years after I'd won the award, four years after the book had even come out. It was into its second printing by that point. So on a, on a cold January in 2013, there's a knock at the door and this guy asks me, are you Jay Galantine? And I'm like, yeah, what's going on? And he hands me this thing the size of the yellow pages and it's a lawsuit from Minovich. He was suing me for libel, slander, uh, unfair competition, misappropriation of the right of publicity, like I was using his likeness without his permission or whatever. Uh, but it was a little scary, I have to tell you, because I had 30 days to respond to this guy. Otherwise, he was going to come after me. Um, he wanted all my money. He wanted to stop publication of the book. It was a 439-page complaint. I mean, when when people sue like Exxon, <laughs> I, I have a feeling that, that that complaint is a lot shorter than 439 <laughs> pages. I had a month to respond. I dropped everything and got on that. There were a number of legal aspects that would sort of invalidate the lawsuit. One of them being that he sued me in the state of California, presumably because it was easy for him to go file that. Um, but California has no jurisdiction over me. I, I live in Minnesota. I've never lived in California. He knew what he was getting into. So there was this whole like assumption of risk. I had all these letters from him, you know, going back years showing that I had shown him exactly what I was going to write. Um, that I was definitely trying to work with him, but I was having a really hard time validating his story. Uh, and so the dude didn't have a leg to stand on. So I, I turned in my response and I scheduled a court date in California. And I got to tell you, I was, I was looking forward to it. I felt like at that point, when I had filed my answer to Minovich's lawsuit, I felt like I was ready for my PhD orals on the history of gravity assist, and I'm not <laughs> even kidding. And uh, in something of a mixed blessing, he withdrew the suit maybe two or three weeks after I filed the response or something like that. And that was the end of it. Well, you know, it's said that you, you haven't made it until you've been served with a, you know, a lawsuit or a cease and desist or, you know, by somebody. So I, I think... I think you and I can yeah. both say we've made it. I tell you, it looks beautiful going away, and it's going to look even better coming back. Your second book, Infinity Beckoned, focuses on inner solar system robotic exploration and rather fascinatingly looks at the Lunacod program. So tell us how you discovered so much about this frankly overlooked, especially in the West, space program. Well, I will say right out and number three isn't even done but but none of the books have matched the proposal there's the book that you say you want to write and that you you tell your publisher that you want to write and then there's the book that you end up writing <laughs> and, the, and the one that comes closest to that really is the first one is as ambassadors from earth because i i started with kind of the post-world war ii rocketry and I took that through to Voyager's Neptune encounter. That was not the original plan. The original plan was I was going to go all the way through to 2004 and the Mars rover Spirit and Opportunity. And I got two years in to a point where I still had not written all the Voyager stuff because I was so bogged down with Minovich. And I'm like, this thing is due in a year and there is no way that I can take it all the way through to the Mars rovers and do justice to any of this stuff. And so I, I talked to Colin about it. Uh, he has been just a wonderful resource and continues to be. Uh, he was totally fine with ending it uh, with Voyager's Neptune encounter. I said, that's perfect because that is going to complete our initial reconnaissance of the solar system. So then when I started in on the second book, 
the original plan was to basically pick up with where the first one left off and once again go through to the Mars rover Spirit and Opportunity. And that didn't happen either. <laughs> and it's because I got so bogged down in these largely Soviet missions that I, I finally got back in touch with Colin and I'm like, dude, I really don't want to get in trouble here. I'll do whatever you guys want. There are just all of these untold stories and and I just keep finding them. Almost every week, I'm like finding something else. When it comes to Lunacod, uh, the thing that amazed me right off the bat is in today's paradigm of robotic exploration, so much of it is happening out at Mars and beyond that we send these commands and then we have to wait. And then a little later, you find out if, if the machine got the command, you find out if it did it correctly, and you find out what the result is. But here, we had a team of five operators driving a car on the surface of the moon, basically in real time. They were doing it on a three second delay, second and a half over, second and a half back, but they were driving it in real time. And the rover even had a continuous mode where they could say like, drive five meters, you know, and, and it would go and do that. It was none of this like inching along, building command sets like they do for curiosity and perseverance. And that was fascinating to me. So part of it was the origin of the mission. Once again, that whole like, why did they build cars? Why did they send it to the moon? What, and, and why did they do it at this point in history? So there was that aspect of it. There was the who were these people aspect of it. I think all but one of whom were around still when I was actively writing the book. It's like, these people are out there. They drove a car on the moon and they're like, somebody's grandpa now. And then the thing that really had me tearing my hair out it was, where were they doing this from? And I spent weeks and weeks trying to find this mythical control center from which the, the Lunacod vehicles were being operated. And part of the problem was that it was a formerly classified military facility. It's off the grid. It's something that I was never supposed to know about if something that was deliberately concealed you know and and here's this guy like in minnesota who's who's apparently going to try and find this top secret facility turned out to be a top secret town somewhere in the soviet union um pretty quickly i was able to establish that it was in crimea and there were a lot of references to a place called simferopol 28 and I kept hearing that. Uh, Simferopol is a major city in Crimea. I looked, I mean, Google Maps just one night after another where I'm like randomly like going through the streets <laughs> of, of Simferopol, like searching for, you know, some place that's apparently going to have a big sign in the yard that I can read <laughs> on Google Maps that says this is the Lunacod Control Center. And finally, one night I found it. So there was this, this distinctive one-of-a-kind dish called the TNA-400, and I had seen it in, in some pictures that purported to be of, like, the horizon of the town. So you didn't really see anything except the countryside and this big dish sticking up. And, and the night that I found the dish was kind of like, oh, my God, <laughs> this is it. And it was this town called Shkolnoi, which is Russian for school. Then even the name of the town was a ruse because they had put a school near the road. And it was a real school with like real students and real teachers. And then past the school was a gate that was manned by a guard, which is a weird thing to have by a school that's sort of out in the middle of nowhere. And then past the gate, the road like dipped down. So from the road, 
you couldn't see anything of the town. You could see the dish, but you couldn't see any of the buildings or anything. And that just had me had me going nuts. And that is one reason why I went into so much detail on this. Uh, I felt like it was a program that was pretty uh, underrepresented, sometimes just completely unrepresented in the literature, uh, that there wasn't much about it. I thought that the the technological breakthroughs on the Lunacod project uh, were pretty impressive, figuring out how to keep a moving vehicle warm for two solid weeks of lunar night, uh, figuring out how to lubricate the gears. Uh, and one way they did that was with this special metal that had powdered glass mixed into it. And when the gears would gnash together, they would heat up and the glass would melt and actually lubricate the gears. Wow. Liquid glass lube. I thought that a lot of the scientific findings um, were were fairly significant in terms of it being a program of exploration that the Apollo astronauts simply couldn't have done. Mm. So in the case of Lunacod 1, you have this vehicle that was driven for months and months and created hundreds of panoramic photographs, took thousands of readings of the soil, found uh, rock outcrops, you know, containing true pieces of the, of the moon's original crust. And you couldn't have done that with Apollo. You, you couldn't have just sent them on a journey and said, see how far you get. Yeah. Let us know what you find. It was a program that was entirely complementary to Apollo. People ask me all the time whether crude versus uncrewed exploration is more important. I really think you need them both. I think they complement each other well. You know, these robots can go and do these things in part because they don't get tired and they don't need to sleep and they don't have to eat. And what else, Emily? Robots don't mutiny. <laughs> It's true. I mean, I hate that, but it is true. They don't have mutiny. So, yeah, that's right. But a robot can't give you its impression. Nothing is going to catch the eye of a robot like it did with Harrison Schmidt on Apollo 17 and the orange soil. So yeah. you really need those two kind of working together in happy harmony. So those were, were some of the major reasons that had me going so head over heels into Lunacon. Mm. It feels like these stories had to be told, and thank you for doing it in such detail as well, because the moon kind of got forgotten after Apollo. Robots on the moon just haven't really connected, even with what's happened on Mars exactly, in exactly. the same way. It's a very different thing. So it's great that I got to learn all about this program, which I had no idea about in such amazing detail as well. All right. So now we're at our final question and uh, you are working on your next book. So can you tell us a little bit about it? What's this going to be about? I know a little bit about it, but not a lot. This book has really turned into a mini biography of a man named John Cassani. And he is, as I like to say, one of the most important people in solar system exploration that that you've never heard of. His influence and techniques are just everywhere. He grew up in Philadelphia, moved to California on a total whim, driving cross country with a buddy. He doesn't have a job. So he goes into the student union at I forget if it was UCLA or, or where it was, goes in there and was like, yeah, I just graduated and I, I don't have a job. And I'm like, John, you, you didn't go to school in California at that school. And he's like, yeah, I know. I, I went to the University of Pennsylvania, but I figured all the colleges work together somehow. <laughs> and they didn't ask where I'd gone. So they just started sending him out on job interviews. And 
he got a few offers. One was from North American Aviation, I believe, and one was from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And he got sent to these really because, number one, he had a degree in electrical engineering. And then the second one was the, the girls who worked behind the counter at the student union he'd gone into were saying things like, oh, we'll send you to interview at JPL. I hear they do interesting stuff. And he went there in 1956 before there was a space age, before Sputnik, before there was a NASA, and he's still there. He's going to be 90 in September, and he is still working for the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Wow. Wow. He tried to retire. He tried to retire first in 1998. <laughs> uh, and then he had another pseudo retirement that was in 2016 or something like that. And through these little tiny things, like he bumps into somebody at a party or something like that. And they're like, oh, you know, we could really use you on something. And next thing you know is he's back on the JPL payroll <laughs> doing something else. And so in this book, I was starting with Galileo. The, the whole undercurrent of the book was supposed to be this Galileo project. Uh, it's got its funding in 1977. It was supposed to launch in late 81 or early 82, and that kept getting pushed back years and years because of all of these development problems with the shuttle. So Galileo was going to be like one of the first, if not the first planetary spacecraft to ride up in the shuttle because that was going to be the new paradigm. We're not going to have any expendable boosters. Everything's going to ride up on the shuttle because that makes so much sense. And so the launch kept getting pushed back. And then finally, it was going to go in May of 1986. And they had it built and they had it at the Cape and they were doing all these integration tests. And then what happened? The Challenger disaster. And everybody who was there at the Cape um, working on Galileo, hundreds of people were like, well, shoot, you know, this is terrible. Obviously, it was this national tragedy. Galileo goes home, like sits under a tarp for three years. Then they finally launch it in 1989 after thinking that they wouldn't be able to because here they had a built spacecraft and no way to get it to Jupiter because what happens in the interim, Jupiter moves oh, and the yeah. supplemental <laughs> stage they were going to use to, to blast it out to Jupiter, that thing gets canceled so they don't have its power anymore. And they, they don't, literally have a way to get to Jupiter. They have a built spacecraft, you know, all the propellant tanks have been sized and everything. It's done. So you have this guy who like comes up with this way to get it to Jupiter by first going to Venus. And then it gets partway there and they try to use it. And the antenna's stuck. It's broken. It won't open. And eventually, almost magically, but really through a lot of blood, sweat and tears, they were able to have an extraordinarily successful mission because of it. Well, Cassani was Galileo's first project manager. So I was going to tell the story of Galileo. Uh, and then I was going to tell the story of the Cassini mission, uh, for which Cassani turned out to be uh, Cassini's first was either. Yeah, he was the first project manager for that. Also, these were jobs that he necessarily did not want to do and at times tried to talk himself out of. <laughs> But the, the reasons that things happen the, the way that they did is by and large because of Cassani. The intent was not to write a Cassani biography, but I would just have more and more conversations with him. I've, I've been interviewing him since 2007, something like that. And over the years, he's slowly opened up to me more and more, and he's talked a little more just about how he would do things and how he would manage his his projects uh, just you know as as that rapport sort of built so it got to the point where i was basically just like calling john every couple of weeks just to check in and say how you doing and uh he would say things like you know so what you been working on um and i would say well actually i'm working on the cancellation of the comet rendezvous asteroid flyby mission and it would be like, oh, yeah, you know, I, I'm the one who recommended that they delete the penetrator from that. And I'm like, what? Really? 
I'm like, I was writing about that sort of as like a one and a half page transition. He's like, oh, let me tell you. So it's the night before I've got to go testify at NASA HQ about why I think we should delete the, the NASA penetrator from that mission. And there's a knock at my door and it's the principal investigator for the penetrator. He's got a six pack of beer in his hand and he's there to try and talk me out of it. And I'm like, oh my God, I just left a voicemail for that guy. He's like, yeah, and he wasn't happy with me. And then a couple weeks later, we're talking again. And, and he's like, so what you've been working on? And I'm like, well, I've been working on uh, kind of a low point in the history of Cassini when the decision was made to delete these two boom arms from the spacecraft. And he was like, oh, yeah, that was my call. I'm like, what? <laughs> that was your decision? He's like, yeah. And I told the space scientists, like, we don't have enough money to keep the boom arms on there. So either we fix them all to the body of the ship or you get nothing. And it was just like one thing after another. Uh, Kasani was one of the, the people who advocated to close the flight projects office in the early 1990s because he could see the end coming for these giant flagship missions like Galileo and Cassini. He's like, People want to do smaller missions. They're sick of these $2 billion one shots, and it's their only ride to Jupiter or Saturn for the next 10 years. Um, I'm hearing all of these uh, rumors and scuttlebutt and undercurrents about how people want to do smaller missions and they think we can't handle it. We need to demonstrate to the space community that we are capable and willing to do these smaller missions and it starts by closing the flight projects office. And that attitude led to this transition between Cassini and, and the Mars Exploration Program. And, and those were dots that I was trying to connect as a writer. It's like, yeah, we're sort of going from these, these giant flagship missions. And next thing I know, we're doing this, this little Pathfinder mission for 150 million. How did we get there? Well, one of the big reasons we got there is Kasani. He wasn't the only force, but he was, like Van Allen, a prime mover in that. And his fingerprints were just on everything. And I'm like, it would be a crime to not talk more about him. There's whole books on Werner von Braun. Um, there's whole books on George Lowe. There's whole books on, on all these key people in Apollo. Why do we not have a book on John Cassani? And it won't be completely about him because there's plenty of other stories. Um, but when it comes to somebody's, really their whole story from birth through the present day, it'll be about Cassani. I love that. Wow. I love an unsung hero. This is right up my street. I can't wait. Right. I want to take you right back to the start of this interview where you said that when you first spoke to Colin Burgess, you weren't sold on the idea of doing robotic spacecraft. You wanted to do the hero missions. You wanted to write about Apollo. You wanted to write about Mercury and Gemini. And now here you are, 15 years, more than that, nearly 20 years later, still down the rabbit hole was there a single moment which you can remember that made you realize that you wanted to devote so much of your time to these spacecraft and tell their story you know you you, you go to a, a gathering of fellow space geeks and everybody knows sce to aux you yeah. know there's there's memes yeah yeah yeah, yeah, um, yeah and and most people know about the mutiny controversy uh <laughs> yeah. you know and they're they're just you know, there, there are a lot of these various things. Apollo 13, you know, building stuff out of spare parts to, to scrub the oxygen. It's like everybody knows these stories. You know, you don't, you don't even have to preamble on them. You know, you can just like SE docs and everybody's like, you bet. Yeah, man. <laughs> when it comes to these other missions, which are exploring space, you know, these, these unpiloted robotic missions to the solar system, I just keep coming across one story after another to the point where I now am having discussions with my interview subjects that go way beyond the scope of the book or the missions that I know I need to cover because I just want to get those stories. Yeah. 
And that's definitely been the case with Kasani. It's been the case with uh, Don Garnett and, and some of these other, you know, really key people in our understanding of the solar system. I think that was a process of discovery on the first book where I went into it with, okay, we're going to do the Van Allen belts and we're going to do the Voyager record and we're going to do like life detection on Mars. And, and they were the, the key things that people have maybe heard of. Even so, you know, so many people, they're like, oh, wow, you write about space. Like, who's the most important person you've ever interviewed? And I'm like, oh, it's, it's got to be James Van Allen. They're like, huh. <laughs> and nobody knows who you're talking about. So it, I don't think it was one specific point in time where I realized that I was hooked. It was just kind of a realization over the first book that there are so many great stories about these people who really worked selflessly to help us understand the solar system. And these are stories that just need to be told. I think that's the perfect place to end this interview. So thank you so much, Jay, for joining us. We've covered a lot today, a lot of different topics. Hopefully uh, people have found it as interesting as I have. So thanks very much for joining us. I look forward to talking more with you about these subjects at another time. Yes, thank you. You're very welcome. And thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Apollo 12, Houston, try FCE to auxiliary, over. FCE to auxiliary. FCE, FCE to auxiliary. We've literally just finished this interview. It was an hour and 15 minutes. It's probably the longest interview we've ever done. It was amazing. That was so amazing. But I don't know how much of it is going to be in. So at the moment, we don't know uh, whether I'm even going to do it as two parts. We'll find out. But that was incredible. What a, what a great storyteller. I love his books. Uh, so it doesn't surprise me the level of depth that he went into writing these books. But where I want to focus this chat, Emily, isn't on anything he said in the interview, but it's on the importance of the Outward Odyssey series. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I believe it, the series itself uh, won an, uh, an Ordway Award uh, either last year or the year before. I think it was the year before, and it was uh, absolutely well-deserved. Colin Burgess and his authors have really done an amazing service for the space community and beyond. You know, I don't know how much uh, they get paid for the, you know, I know authors don't get paid a lot. I'm an author. I don't make millions of dollars for my blog posts, as many people may believe. All jokes aside, they've done an incredible job for um, the space community and and what an incredible collection of just, you know, stories and, and just research for future space historians, you know, beyond. It speaks to the greatness of these books. Jay said that the original idea was to do eight and tell the story of uh, of human spaceflight. And, and now we're well over 20 of these books, and I don't know if there's any end in sight to them, but they're wonderful. Nebraska University Press, they allow for the stories to be told of the unsung her heroes of in spaceflight. And, and for us, they're just wonderful. Yes, we've also within them had the stories that we know and love in, in more detail, because some of them aren't even told. Like SCE SC Talks, yes, in a few documentaries, but that's because of... Go Fly It, perhaps, that book. Yes, people knew of it before, but that's helped really bring that out. And that was one of the books that, that are of this yeah. series. It's just a great series of books. Yeah. Every space geek should have all of them. The mutiny thing, you know, the, yeah. the whole controversy that was, you know, covered in part, you know, in homesteading space, you know, and obviously, you know, other people, in, including myself, have written about it. I actually got the idea, and thank you, David Hitt. He deserves a ton of credit. I got the idea from reading Homesteading Space because I was like, why isn't this more out there? Like, why aren't people talking about this more, you know? And so I really think, you know, that whole series of books, I mean, all of them have just done an incredible service to to our whole community and, and just to, you know, space scholarship in general. And may they go on. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Tell the stories that perhaps people don't know and tell them in a way, like Jay was saying, tell them in a way that's exciting. Try and add some spice to them. Uh, not, not, not untruth, but, but 
Just make them readable. Make them exciting stories for people to read. Find the story within the story. And they're doing this, you know, for Colin to take a, a chance on Jay, who's never written a book before, and say, hey, go and write this book for this series. And him to rise to the occasion as he did on it, win an award. I mean, it's just amazing. It's such a, a cool story. Uh, the story behind the book is cool enough, and I like that as well. So, yeah, check out all the books, but check out Jay's books. I'm sure we're going to deep dive into some of these topics at other times. Um, but it felt, also felt like an appropriate interview to have after what we talked about last week about writing, rewriting history and correcting things that have been incorrectly reported or th- things that have become fact that aren't fact and so on and so forth. So it's a nice, it feels like a nice continuation of where we were last week yeah absolutely yeah to you know sort of set the record straight on things that have been reported a certain way and now it's like wait a minute let's look at this again you know sort of more critically and and think about what actually happened absolutely i love that theme yeah and uh as always the full interview which is well worth watching because i may have had to pull out a fair few stories from this to make it fit today is on our patreon page patreon.com forward slash Space and things. Go check that out. Okay, we've got one more item for you when you get a chance. We'd like you to uh, stir up your cryo tanks. And so, on to this week's news stories. There have been five launches since Emily and I last recorded. One in New Zealand, two from Kennedy Space Center in Florida, one in India, and one in California, which was the fourth consecutive successful mission of a Virgin Orbiter Launcher 1 rocket. And that's one of those ones that gets released from the underside of a modified 747 Jumbo Jet. Very cool. As always, full info of these launches and videos where available can be found on our show notes on spaceandthingspodcast.com or click in the link in the description of this episode in your podcast provider. The launch from New Zealand is an interesting one worth talking about. Rocket Lab launched one of their electron rockets to launch a NASA microsatellite called Capstone. Uh, This is now headed towards the moon where it will end in a near uh, rectilinear halo orbit. I think I said that right. Around the moon. Uh, It's hard to find simple ways of describing what this orbit means in layman's terms, but the simplest of our understanding It's using the gravity of the Earth and the moon to end up in an orbit which goes around the moon from top to bottom, so it's never behind the moon in relation relation to the Earth. This orbit actually hasn't been tried by NASA yet, but it's key to the Artemis program as the space station called Gateway, which they're planning on sending up to the moon to support a moon base, is intended to use this type of orbit. So this is really a test for that. However... Uh, At present time, at the moment that we're recording this, uh, the spacecraft seems to have gone silent. So after a successful launch, NASA are having uh, to troubleshoot and try uh, to try and reestablish comms with the craft and hopefully complete the mission. Uh, While Gateway isn't essential for us to get back to the moon to start with, the Artemis plans really do rely on this being a big part of their missions. So it's already the part which is probably most behind the original schedule. So we could really uh, do with Capstone going well. So let's hope that they figure this out. Yeah, I'm really excited about this whole thing. So I hope they get it sorted. And while we're talking of NASA sorting things out, uh, you may remember that a spacecraft was launched last October called Lucy, which is heading for the Trojan asteroids. And it had some issues with opening one of its solar arrays, which could have some issues consequences for the rest of the mission, obviously with power. Now, NASA has said that it has made significant progress after months of troubleshooting. The solar array needs to be 360 degrees deployed, but originally it would only deploy to 350 degrees due to an issue with a lanyard. But now we're at 357 degrees. Now the craft is in this weird place where the comms team can't reach it very well it only has a basic radio so we can't do anything else with it until it's back in proper range in october so by then they've got a few months to figure out whether they can get these last three degrees of that solar array meanwhile in orbit at mars china has successfully mapped the entirety of the planet just after one year after it arrived and the photos are absolutely amazing Uh, These photos are definitely worth checking out, so visit the show notes for more. Yeah, it's amazing. Absolutely love these these shots. And finally, 
The United States Space Force has set up a new unit to track threats in orbit, and it's going to be called Space Delta 18, and it's looking for threats both kinetic and non-kinetic. Kinetic threats are physical ones which might damage or degrade things that are in space, whereas non-kinetic threat is something like a signing, signal jamming uh, that will disable uh, common communications with a satellite. The United States Director of National Intelligence Intelligence, Avril Haines, has said this. Make no mistake, space is a war-fighting domain today and an ever-increasingly contested one at that. Rather ominous, isn't it? Yeah, yikes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yikes. There is boring soil. Well, don't move it till I see it. It's all over. Boring. Don't move it till I see it. I've stirred it up with my feet. As Dave said earlier, uh, we had a lot of people reach out about last week's episode about Scott Carpenter, so we thought we'd mention a few of those things. Uh, Francis French, whose articles helped us out so much last week, pointed out that Carpenter was never lost on Splashdown. NASA knew where he was, but they didn't share it to the media right away. He also shared with us a, a letter that uh, Carpenter wrote to the editor of the New York Times in 2001 in response to Chris Kraft's book. Uh, Dave tweeted the article with the letter from our account, so check that out if you're interested. It's a good read. Yeah, thanks to others who got in touch. We had someone get in touch who we're not allowed to talk about. Uh, it's completely confidential, but it's blown both of mine and Emily's mind because it was someone who may well have been there. Anyway, uh, yes. that was really great to hear from. Anyway, I don't that know why wonderful. I just mentioned it because I can't say anything about it other than... Wow. Anyway, yeah. uh, thanks to everyone who got in touch and people, including people like Bobby Joyce, who on Facebook said this, uh, Scott really lived up to being from a special group of pilots who had the right stuff when I met him. Cool and charming, who loved recalling his adventures about exploring the deep oceans as much as the space around us. Uh, it's, it's, it's comments like that, which I, I love. So thanks for sharing that uh, with us, Bobby. And thanks to others too. We really love hearing from you. Uh, please continue to get in touch. So that's it for this week. We'll be back next week to talk about Landsat. You might not have heard of it, but you're very aware of it, even if you're not aware of it. And <laughs> <laughs> you'll find out more. And don't forget, in space, no one can hear you me. Space and Things has been brought to you by And Things Productions.